welcome back or welcome to um, the symposium. My name is Emily Bongiovanni. I'm the Open Knowledge Librarian at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, throughout the day, today's sessions and participant questions and conversations really demonstrate an energy to disrupt the research e ecosystem or call for some corporate publishing social responsibility, as well as just this shift in what what we think is collectively important. So I just wanted to make a note that this is really exciting and I love being a part of this community that's so eager for change and um, make movement and disrupt. And it's really great uh, down with the system Friday energy. So thank you for that. Um, some quick housekeeping as a reminder, I'll briefly describe the format of the session. Um, each speaker will give a short talk and then we'll have time for about one or two questions for that speaker. Um, individually. After all three of the talks, we'll invite all of our speakers back on the screen for a panel Q&A. So if you have any questions that might be good for all speakers, I'll invite you just to maybe hold that for the panel at the end, um, at the end of the session. And um, please use the Zoom Q&A function to put all of your questions um, directly in there. Um, so to, this is our last session. Our last session of the day is about open access publishing and some new developments in that area. Unfortunately, one of our invited speakers, uh, Stuart King from eLife, was not able to be here uh, to talk about peer review and eLife's new publishing model, uh, but he has been kind enough to share his slides, and those are available in the community notes, which um, looks like will be um, linked again um, if for those who might need to find it again um, in the chat. So uh, we have three really great talks lined up for this session um, presented by Sanjeev Singh, Joe Krauss, and Alex Portney. Our first speaker in this session is San Sanjeev Sa Singh, a consulting professor at the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University and the CEO of the startup Near Earth Autonomy. He is the founding editor of Field Robotics, a new open access journal. So Sanjeev, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. And so I thought first, as a title, I'd be a little provocative about uh, why not open access. And uh, I, I, I'll leave it at that uh, as a teaser and sort of give you a little bit about my background and how I got interested in publishing. So first, um, I have been at Carnegie Mellon since the 19, uh, since 1985, first as an engineer, then as a PhD student, and then as faculty. And now I'm adjunct. Um, I have this role called consulting professor, which means I go do something else. Um, but meanwhile, what, what uh, you know, has been happening is that I've been sort of at the cutting edge of uh, some of the work that is done in robotics and in, in kind of in all over the world. And, uh, you know, uh, started into uh, kind of a research publishing world pretty early in my career as a uh, as a graduate student and then in, as, a, as faculty members. And so uh, I was es essentially working in an area, a subspecialty area we call field robotics, which is robotics outside the built environment. So it's an interesting area. Um, we didn't distinguish it as a kind of a distinct um, subspecialty for quite a while. Um, and what we did notice was that, you know, people were pretty unhappy about um, the, uh, the publishing world. And this is like, you know, in the late 90s, 98, 99, uh, it was a very cumbersome kind of a process uh, to publish. And, you know, things weren't, you know, abstracts weren't searchable. You, you had to go looking all over the place uh, for, uh, for citations, et cetera. So uh, a few of us started making noise in this area and uh, quickly were co-opted by the leading journal in the, um, in our field called the International Journal of Field, uh, oh, sorry, International Journal of Robotics Research, which is sort of like, you know, typically the number one or two ranked uh, journal in the field, a very broad uh, area of publishing. And so the editor said, hey, listen, why don't you help us do what uh, you, you're seeing uh, some something, some deficiency rather than, you know, he'd heard some rumblings about uh, starting a new journal. So he co-opted us and uh, we worked at it for a while. We helped bring uh, bring uh, to uh, to bear 
a new kind of journal which had electronic access. Now it seems like so antiquated that you could just even do searching of abstracts and you could find papers online, et cetera. So um, very happy. I was very happy with that. And then one day in uh, 2005, um, I had our department heads uh, stop by and say uh, to me, um, hey, listen, Wiley is looking for some way, somebody to take over a journal robotics systems. Um, this is a failing journal and they, they're looking for uh, somebody to just revamp it, et cetera. So, you know, this was a very, this was even a worse journal than the uh, IJRR was when we uh, helped modernize it. Um, and, uh, you know, it had just completely hard paper review, hard to believe that people would actually type up or print these things out, put them three copies in a manila envelope and send it out. Um, and that's how you got your review. Sometimes it took three months, sometimes four months, and you know you'd get a, a, a an acceptance uh, in, in the mail, in physical mail, um, and that would tell you what was going on with your paper. And sometimes it'd have annotations, et cetera. There was no web presence. Uh, you know, they would be sent out these journals that would be in the library, et cetera. So, like you know, it almost seems like it's like World War II age now. <laughs> but that's how most of the journals were. So. Um, so the idea was Wiley was interested, and I, I thought to myself, "There's no way I'm going to do this uh, unless I can. Uh, we can do something that is better than what we're doing already, which is with the best journal in the in the field." Uh, so we we talked to Wiley and said, "Okay, look, we will take over this journal, but it has to be completely reformulated. We have to ask the board to resign, and we'll take a new board, and that that's the only terms we will do. And we'll have to have electronic submission and." electronic review and, uh, you know, all the other stuff that we had asked for IJR. So there was this uh, new journal that was born at the end of 2020, uh, 2005. It was called the Journal Field Robotics. There wasn't even, a, you know, like we hadn't even really distinguished field robotics as a kind of a area before to focus on. And this thing now had almost everything you'd want, you know, electronic workflow, uh, paper copies, electronic, uh, sorry, they they were printing journals, okay, they were printing paper copies, and, you know, as the editor, I would get like 20 of them of every issue and uh, at first, and then there was uh, eight, and then there were three, and then there were zero at some point, um, but essentially, you know, it had access, it was a website, you could, everything was up there, and you could get citations, you could search, it was like, it was like Nirvana, right? And uh, uh, the the other great thing they did was we bargained for was we, we what we needed was a uh, managing editor, a paid managing editor and a stipend, uh, basically a stipend for you know the editorial office, which in, which was then used for um, having meetings and for paying for a part time half time uh, uh, managing editor who would basically corral the authors and help with uh, tracking of, of the um, the papers as they are going through. And then also uh, the person that would help immensely in, with the uh, special issue editor, special issues. So now Journal of Field Robotics got a big uh, start um, by having very uh, a lot of special issues. And these special issues were fundamental. People would come in and they would take over one topic. They would do agriculture or underwater or aerial robotics or space robotics or something like that. We get a very energized community uh, to work on this. But, you know, often these uh, special issue editors didn't know what they were doing. So the managing editor would help uh, immensely. Um, so it went really well, uh, despite the fact that every two years uh, there seemed to be a management change. Okay, we're now Wiley, we're now w Wiley Blackwell, now we're Wiley, uh, Wiley once again, uh, we're Wiley in, in Hoboken, now we moved to Boston, we moved back to Hoboken. All of this sort of stuff was happening uh, all together, but essentially the deal remained the same till about 2017 or so, when a new management chain came around, what they said was, hey, look, listen, this uh, you, you're living high on the hog here. You, you're getting a stipend, and we've got to get rid of that. Um, and uh, we've got to corral you. you. You're not accountable to the uh, to the uh, publisher, and we, uh, we, we need you, you to have a new contract. Um, and... Uh, the new contract would have been that rather than the editor, the editor in chief, myself, 
as the founder was now going to report uh, directly to the um, to the to Wiley rather than reporting to the board. So we tried for two years to see if we could find some sort of common ground with uh, with them. They wanted to increase revenue. They wanted to decrease uh, the cost. They wanted to sell the cover, even though there was no cover at that time. There was no physical copy being uh, produced. Um, and so in uh, 2020, somewhere in 2019 and 2020, what we did was the entire editorial board resigned um, and uh, in protest. And uh, we started um, a new journal called Field Robotics, uh, which had uh, green access. Now, of course, what also happened in 2020 was we hit the pandemic. Uh, it was uh, very difficult to move forward. So um, I took on the the, uh, the the task of basically getting this thing going uh, using my own resources. You know, my own resources, partly my own personal funds, but also discretionary account, discretionary funds that I, I had at Carnegie Mellon um, that had been, you know, been basically a rainy day fund to essentially get this, this journal going. So now it has had some success and it has um, um, uh, basically, it has a, a kind of a difficult future. And I'll talk to you about how that's that's going on. And it's this, this big question mark as to how to go forward. And it all comes down to a few things and I'll, I'll help uh, explain that, okay? So, um, so here's some insights. I, not, nothing here that uh, will be surprising to anybody on this call here. So, first, uh, the role of the traditional publisher is being challenged. Okay, um, and uh, you know, I I feel for them. Uh, the the traditional publishers have been uh, greedy and difficult to work with. Um, they have, uh, you know, I don't need to give you that whole thing. You guys all know that. Uh, and they, they're basically with the electronic access, uh, they, you know, there's a question about what do, what value do they provide when we had paper copies, they were at least, they were printing them and, uh, laying them out and printing them and distributing them. But all of that is, they don't even do that anymore. They, they run a website and, uh, you know, what they're trying to do is, you know, essentially, even if they're electronic, they're trying to increase their revenue and they're trying to decrease the cost. So the idea here is the traditional publisher does not do much uh, anymore. OK, uh, you don't need um, a um, you don't need them to be able to do it, but you do need some other things. OK, and so that these are the key insights that were happening just as the same thing was being uh, the publishing world is sort of going through its own throes. I think they're they're having trouble uh, with their finances and, you know, um, just justifying their own uh, thing. But we as the people who basically generate the content, we review it, we, you know, give do and then cite, cite it and all of that work. Uh, basically realize, hey, we, we don't really need to do, we don't really need them anyway. Uh, everybody does LaTeX in my world already. Uh, forget about, you know, laying out on some other kind of thing. So why do we need them at all? Okay, so here's here's some quick thoughts about my, my things of basically having worked for about 25 years on um, scholarly publication. So what a good journal needs is first and foremost, it needs a really good editorial board. And it's hard to get that. It's very hard to get a good editorial board. People are, you know, sometimes people sign on to editorial boards that are not, are not really engaged. Um, I think what you need is, sorry, I meant uh, engaged community authors and, and, uh, and readers really, um, instead of authors and community. Uh, so you need an engaged community, people who are like, you know, who would read the book and uh, read the journal and then and submit to it, et cetera. You need fast turnaround because if you don't have fast turnaround, people get very cynical. They worry about it. They think about how they're going to get uh, these papers out, done, cited, all of that uh, uh, for their, um, uh, for, um, uh, for the promotion cases, okay. Uh, so that's that's a that's sort of, these are easy to uh, understand. Uh, but what we also need for a good journal is you need money, okay, and you need money for um, managing the papers. And this is done sometimes. You know, all the big uh, publishing houses, even the ones that do this well, 
um, have basically a rotating staff of whoever is there. It's kind of like a help desk rather than somebody who has a relationship. But we found that a, 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 pub, a publication, sorry, an editorial manager um, was absolutely critical to the success of a journal. Uh, we've built a kind of a really great following by having one person who would show up to conferences and talk to people, uh, not just a sort of an email address um, and that they got, you know, anonymous kinds of responses from. But then also a workflow to do a submission review decision process that's electronic, right, web-based kind of thing. We've used uh, Scholar One, um, and that's not cheap. So, you know, something that or something like that. Uh, you need you need to be able to pay for it. You also need to be able to pay for somebody to lay out uh, journals properly so that people will take them seriously because the competition does that. okay. So you can you can take things that look like they're just very easily laid out and they stretch on, uh, not well laid out, but there's a kind of a distinct kind of uh, you know idea that papers are still treated more um, better in uh, if they are laid out professionally and they they're proofread and they are um they they have good captions and they you know there's some consistency to them and not something that looks like it comes out of archive and then you need um you need the dollars to have a website that can actually distribute these papers so that you know uh somebody can go access uh, these kinds of things so um you know that's what a, these are things a good journal needs now you know you you can do most of this the first three by having engaged community because you know they just do it because they they need they want to do it but the uh what's missing is really and actually what open access i'm going to say doesn't have is doesn't have good economic models well you know there are there's gold access and green access so authors can pay it's not satisfying you know i mean authors uh are sometimes have a hard time paying for these journals have to find money, a couple of thousand dollars usually in their research grants to be able to pay for it. There are countries where, you know, that's a fortune. Uh, so there's no, that's not a really great answer there. Um, many uh, journals have realized that they can have an open access kind of a, a sorry, a access this way, open access by having the authors pay ahead of time, typically a few thousand dollars in my world. And we could also have a, like a sugar daddy, right? And so I already used this informal slang here, but like, okay, somebody would say, all right, go, you know, here's a set up an endowment, a couple million dollars, and here's a hundred thousand dollars or something like that every year, you run this thing. And then, you know, that's, uh, but where do we find that? Somebody who doesn't have a conflict of interest. So the there's been this, been this question about, can we have the readers pay something? You know, like, you know, if you, if you listen to a song or if you, um, have something on YouTube or somebody who consumes has some way of basically one way or the other uh, having the people who consume this information provide some monetization is is a question that we've been looking at. So um, what's happened with this is that you know this the cost of running um, the field robotics thing I'll sort of go back to this here. Uh, green access, which is completely free to submit, completely free to, to read. We've tried it for three years, uh, 2020, 21, uh, sorry, 21, 22, 23. We're in the third third year of, uh, of uh, running this. Has come to close to $50,000 a year. And basically, I have personally taken on that, that challenge to get this thing launched. And uh, we're kind of like at a basic... Um, an impasse to be able to find that kind of money from the right kind of place, uh, kind of an arm's length, somebody would not have a conflict of interest at all, um, or go back to a society to see if we would get uh, get them to take on this as a, a transactions that, uh, you know, would be managed in the traditional way. So um, I've given <laughs> a lot of thought to this over 20 years or 25 years. And uh, I, I don't have a satisfying answer for this economic model. And I'd be interested to talk to anybody who would possibly have, um, you know, thoughts on how to make this thing, uh, make, a, make something like this sustainable so it doesn't run, you know, with li only light supervision and has a completely pro kind of a look to it um, in such a way that, uh, you know, it satisfies all stakeholders. 
So I'm going to stop there. I don't know. Did I, uh, is that uh, good for, for now? I don't know if I ran over. Or yeah, San Sanjeev, that was great. Um, definitely on trend with this change making energy and um, really interesting talk. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of boycotts on in terms of purchasing the subscriptions to journals, but you don't hear a lot of uh, groups and entire board of editors walking out. And so that's pretty, uh, it was really interesting to to see that, you know, that's, you know, what you found was necessary to make, to at least be responsive. Um, we probably have time for one quick question directly to Sanjeev. Um, if anyone has one, they're um, burning to ask, but as a reminder, we're gonna have um, all the panelists back together at the um, end of the talks uh, for questions for all of them or directly to them. So um, I'll need to see the Q and A. Uh, yeah, we do have one. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, we here at CMU Libraries have a nascent journal publishing service and would love to talk to you about, oh, potential pass forward, not a question, but a comment, but that was yeah. from Nikki, uh, Nikki, our new associate dean um, for academic engagement at the CMU Library. So sounds like we'll be uh, continuing some conversation. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I we we have spoken to the CMU Library uh, and I'm, I'm really happy to continue the conversation about how to make this thing happen. It, it, yeah, there are some nuances there on how to do this and how to put content on there and how to moderate it. The, the big deal here is this, right? I mean, where do we find the money to run the management and the layout? That's the issue. So if somebody has, I mean, what I what I heard there was in the previous thing, I'm just going to be completely forward here. Um and maybe there are ways to solve this, is that, hey, look, if you have content um, that's laid out, um, then we have some way to sort of curate it, okay? Uh, well, the question is, how do we do this, uh, you know, uh, this intuitive submission, review, layout, uh, and all of that, uh, how do we pay for all of that? And that's the trick, right? Because I think the CMU uh thing doesn't doesn't do that there was for a while there was this thing called open ojs and we were working with them but uh during the pandemic that that was a something between harvard and Pitt, i believe and uh that that thing uh was oversubscribed or they didn't have funds themselves and we were after going through a pretty extensive process we were told that uh, they were not going to follow up follow through with uh, being able to host our journal so happy to talk about that. Uh, if there's a way to do this, the, the economic model still needs to be taken, uh, you know, considered. Great. Well, thank you for that talk. Um, we'll go ahead and um, switch speakers. So um, our next speaker is Joe Krause from the Colorado School of Mines. Joe co-administers the Mines Repository, and he is he was an editor of the journal collaborative librarianship from 2009 to 2016. And he is a founding co-editor of the Journal of Creative Library Practice. So uh, Joe, I can see your slides in a PDF format. So I think that's probably what you're intending. It seems like you're you're good to go. Yeah, so hopefully I can just hit the down button. Okay, it looks like, does everybody see the next slide? I do, yes. Okay, so um, first I'll just start by well, adding in some thank you uh, very much, uh, Emily, for the great introduction. Um, first, I'm going to plan on putting in my slides into the repository so that way you can find this later on, so that way you don't have to try and take notes on everything. But um, um, see, at the Colorado School of Mines, I'm going to refer to it as just mines, so that way I don't have to say uh, Colorado School of every single time. Um, so I've been with MINES since you know, a little over four years, and I've been helping them uh, move um, the repository uh, called the MINES repository from uh, one system to another, both using DSpace. And before I was at MINES, I was at the University of Denver from 1998 to 2016. And I've been in open access advocates going back to 1993 when I first really started using the internet and I think the first time I used the you know the concept of open access was in 1999 in a presentation that I gave but I think even in 1999 you know the phrase open access wasn't a thing um 
And Emily mentioned the two journals that I've been working on. Uh, the first one, Collaborative Librarianship, that started uh, using um, the OJS software. Um, and I did work on layout with that. And I also worked on um, a section of website called Collaborative Librarianship News. Um, and with the Journal of Creative Library Practice, that's done with a small editorial board and we use WordPress as the, as the platform. And it's essentially just um, putting information into the WordPress website. And I also help with the layout on that as well as other editorial duties, but it, they're both uh, pretty small. I think the Journal of Creative Library Practice, we usually get about seven to 10 articles a year. Collaborative librarianship might be more like um, 40 to 50 articles or items a year. And I think collaborative librarianship has since moved to a different platform at the University of Denver using another uh, repository system. Okay, um, I also want to note that I'm uh, part of a team. Um, I help co-administer the Minds repository with Christine Baker. I also work with a working group um, involving Lisa Dunn, Seth Valetich, Nicole uh, Bequar. So you know, it's, it's not just me who does the Minds repository. Um, I work with a lot of other people. And I know today uh, as a symposium, it's more about open science as a big concept versus just open access. Um, so there's different flavors of open access. Um, the previous speaker you know, talked a lot about you know, the gold open OA repositories often use the green flavor. Um, the Journal of Creative Library Practice is a diamond OA uh, journal. So there's a lot of different types of open access. Um, and with open science, there's a lot of other things that need to go on um, that libraries take part in doing, uh, working on open educational resources, um, we provide open access uh, fees, support um, for those gold OA journals that need um, uh, financial support. Uh, we provide advice and scholarly communication, copyright issues, um, open data resources. Um, and we have also have investigated, considered, and signed transformative agreements with publishers in order to incentivize um, open access for some of our researchers at Minds. Um, two recent developments that took place. Um, well, I'm sure most of you hopefully have heard of um, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy came out with uh, the recommendation that taxpayer supported research should be immediately available to the American public at no cost. And this policy should be taking place no later than the end of 2025. So that uh, has stirred some discussion on our campus. And before that, there was also a national security presidential memorandum, uh, NSPM 33. And this asks uh, researchers in order to ask the researchers on campus to use uh, persistent identifiers, DPIs, um, in many cases, uh, it's using an ORCID ID as a way to keep track of researchers. So th this memorandum has helped us set up conversations with some of the other research groups on campus since we want to help our researchers get uh, ORCID IDs in order to help track their research. So since I've got the title of the document or the title of this uh, talk being Supporting Open Science on a Small Budget, what do I mean by small? And I know small is relative. Um, so in our case, uh, we are just recently moved up to be a Carnegie R1 institution. And I you know just like a day or two ago, I think I read in Inside Higher Education that the Carnegie um, R1 classifications and R2s and the other things, they're probably gonna be changing in the next couple of years. So that way, it'll the, the way Carnegie um, or you know institutions are categorized might be a little bit different in the next you know, couple of years hopefully or probably so you know compared to the other R1 institutions there's a little over a hundred public um, R1s 
uh, we're, I think we're pretty much the smallest as far as size of student body with about 7,000 total students, roughly five or 6,000 undergraduates and maybe one or two uh, graduate students. We've got a relatively small library budget compared to a lot of other R1s. Uh, we've only got under 20 uh, faculty and staff, um, so it's pretty small. And uh, the size of a repository, we've got um, under 19,000 titles. So compared to some other repositories that are done by other R1 institutions, like some of them might have 70,000 or over 100,000 items in their repository. And we also have a small budget for the repository. Uh, we outsource uh, the commercial hosting of it. So it's, um, you know, it'd be nice if we could you know, pay for full-time technical staff and a server, but it's all uh, outsourced. So some of the issues that we address because we are small, um, we're limited to one repository system. It would be nice if we had two or three different kinds, like, like one for main, one for documents, one for images, um, our special collections. People would love to have a second repository that would be able to highlight some of the great images that we've got. And then one for data. Um, but, you know, we just have one repository system to do all three main tasks. Uh, it would also be nice if we um, would could move to DSpace version 7.6, I think, uh, when we want. But right now, um, the hosting company still has us on a newer version of DSpace. Um, concerning that memorandum from 2021, um, we wanted to add in an ORCID API feature into the repository, but we can't do that until we move to DSpace uh, 7.x. Um, so we can't you know, just take advantage of that quite yet because we're, we don't have the staffing in order to move us to uh, the next version of DSpace. And we also recently lost access to Google Analytics data because Google changed the way they collect the usage data. So um, we could pay more money to the hosting company in order to uh, set up a different uh, statistics gathering system, but uh, we just need to you know, wait until we um, get the, the new version up and running, hopefully in early 2024. So see, so how, how am I doing for time, Emily? You're doing well. You've got about uh, five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, so some of the... Uh, future directions that we've got. Um, we want to include more content for more departments. Uh, some departments seem to uh, give us more information and data than others. Uh, we want to in increase the amount of research data. Um, we're getting a smattering of smaller data sets, but um, not all that much. Uh, we want to make the self-submission system easier to use. Um, we'd like to e expand our sources of funding. Um, and I think a long-term goal for me would be to, and I would love it if we had a campus-wide mandate to have um, like all of the researchers submit all of their um, post-print articles into the repository. But um, I think if we do start those dis discussions of making that kind of culture change, we'd probably wanna do it at the departmental level first and hopefully then move in that discussion onto a campus-wide mandate. So now um, I want to take a couple of minutes to do kind of a show and tell to show you, you know, the kinds of stuff that we do have in the Minds repository. So we've got things like uh, videos, images, um, aerial photographs. Um, okay. so that's a, a lot of theses and dissertations. And I think the theses and dissertations are some of the, the most highly used stuff that we've got. Uh, we have whole conference proceedings uh, with like hundreds of papers, a lot of open educational resources, special collections materials. There's a lot of special collections stuff in there. Uh, reports from uh, research institutes. We've got um, curriculum items, uh, whole books, uh, newsletters, uh, student publications. I've been working with uh, different uh, units on campus to try and get more uh, student publications, but they seem to have low uptake. We've got 
maps, uh, data sets. Uh, there's an example there. We've got um, post prints of book chapters, journal articles. So I guess um, I I wanted wanted to do this presentation more as a instead of it being just you know how we've done it good. What can we do to to do it better? How can we better affect our, our culture change on campus in order to get more uptake of um, having more people put stuff into the repository? And what kind of incentives can we use? I know promotion and tenure guidelines. Um, a lot of campuses use that in order to try and help get more people to use uh, the re the local repository. But you know, I guess I want to use this as uh, just a good way to ask for feedback from all the attendees. So I think that's it. Well, thank you, Joe. And thank you for uh, asking. I, 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 I like that you've asked a specific question to the audience that hopefully that'll get some engaging conversation. Um, I do have a question specifically for you, and I guess I could, I'll, I'll ask it now, but we can also, um, I'll be curious to maybe even see what the other speakers have to say. But I'm thinking about, um, you know, how we're, there's a lot of conversation today about, you know, educating our current students on these open science topics. And I'm, how do you see, or have you used the MINDS Institutional Repository as a mechanism for teaching students about open science topics? Or more broadly, how do you see institutional repositories as a mechanism for teaching current students? See, I've, tried to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, we'll get questions like, I'm also a reference librarian as well as working on the digital repository since uh, all of us librarians have to wear so many different hats. So um, I think you know, discussing you know, the changing nature of scholarship, trying to get students to understand and take part in open science initiatives. Um, has worked in some cases, and I've, I've also have tried to you know, do workshops. So we've got a good workshop series where we can uh, have five or 10 or 20 different graduate students come to a workshop session. So um, that sometimes that, that helps us get the word out. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I'll ask folks to hold any other questions till the um till our next speaker is finished. But thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. All right. And last but certainly not least, um, our last speaker of this session is Jason Jason Portnoy. Jason is a senior data engineer at Open Alex, the open comprehensive catalog of the global research system. Um, it's his job to understand and improve Open Alex's data and to show people how to make use of it. So, um, Jason, if you want to share your screen, you'll be good to go. How is that looking? I'm seeing, oh, we're good. I'm seeing it and uh, I'm seeing what I'm supposed to see. Great. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Portinoy. Um, I'm the senior, senior data engineer at Our Research, uh, which is the nonprofit um, that makes Open Alex, um, as well as a few other products, uh, including um, Unpaywall and Unsub and a few others. Um, and uh, first, thank you for, uh, for inviting me here. Um, thank you for the introduction, Emily. And um, also, just want to apologize. I had some I'm recovering from some unexpected dental surgery, so I'm not um, exactly at 100% now, and I'm adapting this presentation from a uh, a longer one. So I'm not sure if I'm going to speed through it and um, take too little time or run way over time, but I will uh, do my best on that. Um, so uh, Open Alex is an open and complete index of the global research ecosystem. Um, when I talk to friends and family uh, outside of this world about what we do, I usually start hopefully with, uh, have you heard of Web of Science? Have you heard of Scopus? Um, the answer is no, uh, inevitably, but I, I move on. Have you heard of Google Scholar? And sometimes the answer is yes there. Uh, but that's, that's sort of the, the, the world we operate. Um, 
in. It's it's about uh, um, meta science, science of science, uh, science as data. But uh, uh, all research publications um, and uh, connections between them, um, and we call this scientific knowledge graphs or SKGs. Um, and they're becoming essential infrastructure for a variety of, of use cases, including uh, research discovery, if you're just looking for research, uh, science and metrics, and research intelligence and assessment. Um, so what we actually do at, at a basic level is, is we index all uh, works, works being, uh, there's a, a lot of ways to define it, but scientific research, scholarly research, we've already had some discussion about this today. I, I, I remember, but uh, uh, scholarly publications is, is what we're interested in. Um, and then also things that are connected to that. So sources such as journals and repositories, uh, concepts that they're about, publishers, institutions, funders, authors. And we uh, keep track of the, as many of these as, as we can and link them uh, amongst each other's uh, to, to the works. Um, and these are some counts of what we have. We can actually uh, go to our API to get up-to-date counts. Um, just, of course, uh, not, not uh, important to know all this, but just some of the metadata we have available for, for um, these different um, types of things that we announce, which we call entities. Um, we have like titles, publication dates, uh, persistent identifiers, um, including our own DOIs, PubMed IDs, um, open access information, uh, the type of open access, the um, article uh, processing charges, APCs, um, funder information. These are all things we try to keep track of. Uh, and then institutions, authors, sources, concepts, and, and various metadata about all of those. Um, anything else I wanted to... Yeah, so um, moving... Back back to uh, some examples of SKGs that already exist. We have Web of Science. We have Scopus, uh, which is owned by Elsevier. Google Scholar uh, is a question mark. It's it's not exactly the same thing, um, but it's a it is mentioned a lot in this space. Um, Microsoft Academic Graph, uh, which we are um, basically they they sunsetted. Uh, they are, they no longer exist, um, but they released. Uh, their project their, uh, to, to the community. And we are building, um, basically we took the mantle from them and, and uh, we are building on, on what they did. Uh, Dimensions is another one, Crossref and um, OpenAlex. Uh, so the OpenAlex is very young. Um, we, uh, Microsoft announced, announced that MAG was uh, going away, Microsoft Ac Ac Academic Graph. Um, and they actually discontinued it December of 2021. Open Alex launched in uh, January of 2022, and we've been moving uh, very quickly since then. And we're we're still young, we're still scrappy. Hopefully, you've heard of us, but um, if if you haven't, uh, hopefully you will soon. Or I mean, you have today, but uh, you'll be hearing more and more of us because we we are up and coming in this space. Um, we launched a user group uh, and a and a customer support ticket system, which is really important because we are really uh, intent on engaging directly with, with the community. Um, we want a two-way conversation about what we're doing. We're building everything out in the open. Um, and we're trying to, to differentiate ourselves from big players like Web of Science and Scopus in that way. Uh, we introduced full text search in August 2022. Um, I joined in February of this year, 2023. Uh, and soon after that, we started offering a premium service, which um, is just a, is a paid service that's part of our sustainability model. Um, we are mostly funded by the uh, charitable fund Arcadia, um, but we are moving toward a sustainable model, which Unpaywall is already um, enjoying, uh, doing a pretty good job of. And um, it's a, a premium offering that, that uh, certain offers uh, certain benefits in terms of, of the services we offer. But our core offering of, of the data um, is is totally free and open and always will be. Uh, 
our uh, one big thing we did over the summer is is launch uh, an improved author disambiguation uh, system. Um, we are constantly working to to uh, try to improve the data as much as we can, um, and uh, to have it be a viable source for for all sorts of um, research intelligence and assessment uh, uh, use cases. Um, so our big selling points are we are big, easy, and open. Um, we have about twice the coverage of, of other services. We have um, almost 250 million works uh, and much better coverage of non-English works and works from the global South uh, than, uh, um, than our competitors. Uh, we are easy. We have a, a fast, modern, and well-documented uh, service. And uh, we are probably most important to, to this audience is, is we are open. Our complete data set is, is free under the CC0 license. And uh, that allows for transparency and reuse. Um, so I'm going to talk a little more about that that open thing. Uh, it's a it's really a major feature for us uh, that we're open. It's half of our name, Open Alex, um, of course. And uh, so we we do take it seriously. Um, and so in contrast to the other uh, the other SKGs, the pay pay to view SKGs, um, their subscriptions are costly. Uh, their results can't be shared, and by by extension, your results can't be shared. Uh, you can't necessarily build on them, and you inherit uh, their exclusiveness. So I'll talk a, a little bit about each of those. Um, their subscriptions are costly, so uh, that's a problem. Obviously, pressure on budgets is intensifying at universities. Uh, also, paywalls systematically exclude less, less wealthy regions. And um, after paying for, even after paying for a subscription, your access is limited. Uh, Open Alex is free, uh, enabling equitable access across the globe, and we don't limit access to data at all. Um, more about that, that, how your access is limited, and uh, and the licenses are, are tend to be pretty restrictive, so their results can't be shared. And by extension, whatever you do with it cannot necessarily be shared in full. Uh, and that limits transparency in, de in decision making and limits the reproducibility of, of research about research. And because Open Alex is completely open, anyone can examine and replicate the analyses. And uh, yeah, so uh, another point is you can't necessarily build on the other SKGs. So uh, you don't have access to the full data sets. Um, you can't use it commercially, uh, obviously. You can't uh, integrate with internal or external dashboards, and you can't really develop derivative tools. And these are all things that you can do with Open Alex and um, have, have people have been doing. Uh, it's completely open under the CC0 uh, license, which is public domain. Anyone can examine and, and make use of it however they wish without getting any lawyers involved, without just having to worry about, about that at all, um, even for commercial use. Uh, and this, uh, we're, we're already seeing this. It, uh, we have a, a thriving community of people developing exciting tools um, and extensions based on the data. Um, and we're working with a lot of them too. Um, last problem is is uh, one of the equity and, and um, exclusion. Uh, the other SKGs tend to have these exclusiveness criteria that, that can create biases. Uh, some examples are uh, to be included in those, you must have an English abstract. Um, they don't include preprints. Uh, theses and dissertations are excluded. There's certain types of peer review which aren't allowed. Um, for example, in the law profession, there's a lot of research that just isn't included because the peer review uh, works differently in that field and, and it's it's systematically excluded from those, uh, those SKGs um, and a, a few other. And so Open Alex is, has a philosophy of being inclusive and allowing you to, to apply filters to pick which data you uh, do and do not want to include for whatever purposes you're using it for. Um, so this is about uh, OpenAlice benefits from an open ecosystem um, 
we really couldn't have, have done this even a few years ago, but it's the momentum around um, open data, open scholarship that that is enabling us to be able to do what we, we did. And you can understand this uh, um, as uh, we, we inherited a lot of data from Microsoft Academic, which worked a lot like Google Scholar, crawling the internet, uh, trying to, to find all, all the articles that way. Um, but going forward, we're mostly using Crossref, uh, which is all about um, you know publishers and uh, and anyone publishing uh, uh, scholarship um, making it open uh, for for these types of purposes. So you can see that these graphs just show um, that uh, over time and in, in publication date. Um, the proportion of of works that that are coming from Crossref with this open data that we're able to make use of uh, is is vastly increasing. Um, we're also benefiting from open source machine learning tools, uh, pub, uh, uh, and and uh, database and and uh, architecture tools, and uh, a bunch of different um, publicly available uh, data sources. Um, such as Crossref, uh, Orchid for Authors, uh, ROAR, the amazing ROAR uh, initiative for institutions, and um, Wikidata, Wikidata for um, a lot of structured, uh, you know, crowdsourced data around uh, um, knowledge and concepts. Uh, Open Alice has broader co coverage than any other SKG. This is a pretty... Uh, Somewhat out of date, but just comparing us to to some of the other ones, um, we uh, uh, have about almost 250 million works at this point, which is significantly more than Web of Science and Scopus. Um, Google Scholar does beat us among the estimates that have been done, but their uh, data is is very uh, closed down, and we don't really actually know how much they have. Um, uh, so, yeah, if you want to look at, at, at how we're being used, um, we have a lot of testimonials on our website. Um, and this is one example from um, Voss Viewer, which is a, a popular visualization tool, um, but they're able to ingest our data uh, directly from the API, have, have live uh, network style visualizations um, of, of science. Uh, more testimonials from a variety of use cases, people using us in industry, in uh, research, in um, uh, nonprofits, libraries, all sorts of, of cases, and we're working with a lot of them. Um, just uh, We are also open about our, our limitations to just go through a few of them. Um, we inherit bias from, from uh, our sources, our biggest sources being Crossref and and Microsoft Academic, and they do have have their own inclusion biases. Uh, in, ter in terms of um, of a, a research base of people doing scientometrics research based on on Open Alex and things like that, uh, we are so young that there isn't a lot of that going, but it is uh, it's coming rapidly, and, and there's more and more of that uh, being conducted, and it's it's very encouraging. Uh, we have great coverage, of course, but uh, like I said, but um, we are missing some things. We have limited software and data sets. We do include a lot of them, but uh, it's not our focus. We don't have patents, but notably, um, there's a, a professor at, at Cornell, I believe, who, who was, uh, has done work linking our data to patents, which uh, the open nature of our data allows that, that, that sort of extension of uh, what we do. Um, and uh, another limitation is our stability. We are improving constantly, um, but uh, you know, even from day to day, uh, you will see changes in our data, sometimes in our data schema. Uh, we're at that stage now where we are uh, building something rapidly and, and uh, it is uh, not entirely stable. Um, so there are three main ways to open to use Open Alex. You can use them right now. Um, one is the snapshot, which is the entire data set. You can just download it all right now. Um, 
And that is a big difference between us and, and um, other SKGs. Uh, we offer it through Amazon uh, S3, but it's it's the full data set. It's not that easy to work with. It's a lot of data. Um, we suggest you start with the API and uh, or um, not to, not download the whole data set because it's unwieldy and, and, and difficult to work with, but you certainly can. And there are a lot of people doing it. There are a lot of uh, use cases that it, it enables. Um, the API is has been the main way to work with it. You enter a structured URL. Uh, you can apply filters, you can apply group buys to, to count things, um, but it will just send you back the data. Uh, so this this URL will get, get you all the works, but if you apply some filters, you only want open access works, you only want open access works from a certain institution, you specify all that in the URL and it'll just uh, um, return the data to you. Um, and that does require some programming experience and for, for people who uh, um, don't have a lot of that, we uh, we have a web interface coming out. Um, it'll allow for all sorts of searches, group buys, uh, analytics. Um, that's coming very soon. So uh, please be on the lookout for that. Uh, I am going to skip through most of this. This is some research intelligence uh, use cases um, that that can be made uh, pretty easily with Open Alex, um, but uh, just to demonstrate, like this is to analyze an institution's work. Like I said before, we tag sustainable development goals (SDGs) from the the UN um, in our works uh, as an example. So you can you can um, see the different SDGs at a at a given institution, and it's a a relatively simple. Uh, a structured URL that's that's actually included in in our uh, our user interface. Um, this is a way of of tracking um, how are we progressing towards our OA goals as an institution uh, using a, a another structured URL. Um, and I, I'm going to call it there because it, it seems like uh, we're I am running a little long, um, but we uh, want you to 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 use Open Alex uh, if you haven't already tried it. Uh, we definitely welcome your feedback at this this URL. We have um, a lot of uh, well structured documentation which uh, could answer a lot of your questions. But of course, I am happy to answer anything uh, any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And uh, there's. Definitely um, some some questions that have uh, popped up um, for you specifically. So I'll maybe toss a couple of those your way and then we'll invite all the speakers um, back and continue on with the, the larger Q&A. But thank you. Very interesting, um, especially to kind of hear the nuts and bolts behind it all. Um, so let's kick this off with... Um, well, there's one question just um, saying that I remember testing a beta version of the user-friendly interface of Open Alex. Is that still available or was it rolled back? Uh, it's So we will be announcing the actual beta. Uh, I'd say the, the what, what you call a beta, we were calling the alpha. Um, and uh, the beta is coming, should be... Uh, it should be in the next few days, actually. Um, so it's I can't I can't exactly say that it is out or it will be out, but it uh, it is coming very soon. Um, it's going to look a little different from the alpha version that 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 you saw. Um, but uh, yeah, if if you're in the the user group, uh, we'll definitely make an announcement on there, um, or you can just keep uh, checking back to openalex.org. Um, but we're going to to basically switch it over so that the the beta version um, of the UI will be what you see when you go to Open Alex. So you'll just be able to immediately start exploring the data. Great, thank you. And another question on um, Open Alex. Um, it says uh, someone said I might not be understanding correctly on how you collate your data, but if you're automatic. But if you're automatically pulling articles from multiple sources, do you worry about duplicate records? 
Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that, uh, um, yeah, it, it's it is a, a little complicated, and I'm, I'm I apologize for not making it clear. Uh, that's the core of what we do is is that sort of deduplication. Um, so we we get a, a lot of uh, you know information about this article that come came from Microsoft Academic. They they released all their data when they sunsetted it and said here's here's all the works. Uh, we get something from an update from Crossref and. Uh, so yes, we do a lot of, of work to, to deduplicate. Um, the easiest way is, is with DOIs, uh, um, which is becoming increasingly available and is great. Um, but beyond that, we, we, we do our best um, to identify uh, one persistent identifier. We assign our own open Alex ID for a given work. And then we have a concept called locations, which is, um, the places on the internet that you can find this work, either behind a paywall or open, um, and uh, we we will list out the primary location, which is what will be considered the version of record, say if it's in a journal, the best OA location, if it's in a repository where you can just grab it. Um, we'll list uh, any others if it's in PubMed. We'll we'll list that, um, but ideally, it's all under the same. If we're if we're doing a good job, which um, we think we are, uh, but not, not certainly not perfect. Um, all of those locations will be uh, collated in the same the same work, which we duplicated. Great, thanks. Um, and we've I've got a couple more questions lined up, but I'll invite actually all the speakers um, back just so that way if they can chime in across questions and we keep this more of a conversation. So. Um, Sanjeev and Joe will bring you both. And then uh, Jason, you can stop your share. It's amazing these Zoom wizards behind the scenes and how they just make magic happen, um, really. Um, so um, I I have another question that came through for um, Jason specifically, but um, Sanjeev and Joe, feel free to you know chime in on your thoughts as well. Um, so this person says, I work in the evidence synthesis space and know that Open Alex is already making possible completely new ways of synthesizing research and making things like living systematic reviews more possible. How do you see knowledge graphs like Open Alex changing the way we search for and discover scholarly information, maybe particularly in light of, lar of, in light of large language models and GPT technology? Yeah, so I, um, I don't want to say anything about our our roadmap or or anything or what we're planning on doing. We don't actually have uh, any specific plans of using large language models. Um, I think that the work we're doing uh, will certainly enable um, all sorts of of use cases of of organizing uh, scholarly knowledge. Um, and, and helping out with that. Personally, I've I've heard you know a lot of reports of large language models just making up things about the scientific literature, and um, I could imagine that that some that some the work we do could help with that because that's a, that's a really scary thing. Um, you you ask a large language model to give you a well cited article in this area and. It, it might come up with just something completely fabricated. So if you bound it to something like we're doing, which is, um, you know, we're we're trying to to keep an eye on what what's actually happening, um, uh, you can uh, hopefully put some bounds on that and and not let that happen. Um, yeah, uh, we are. We also um, we. Oh, that's probably. Thanks. And uh, Joe and Sanjeev, I'm not sure if you have any comments or thoughts or concerns in that area, if you wanted to share, uh, but you're welcome to. Well, I do wonder why theses and dissertations are kept out of the system. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I think it'd be great if you could draw upon those because that's such a huge part of our minds repository. Yeah, so we do actually include 
um, a lot of theses and dissertations. And I think, uh, you know, we, we uh, I think the the only reason we have at this point of not including any given dissertation is um, that we're not doing a good enough job. I don't think we have any exclusion criteria necessarily of uh, any reason that we wouldn't exclude them. Um, it's just we we are fo focusing more on trying to get all of the traditional um, scholarly publications, uh, you know, journal art articles, um, or or similar of, of what people consider that. Um, so it's uh, it's just that we 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 haven't gotten to them yet, and um, and we are working on it. Uh, but I don't I don't think we necessarily have a exclusion criteria around those. We already have a lot of them. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question, I'm thinking this one specifically for Joe. Um, do researchers at your institution self-archive their research output? What method do you use for researchers to submit the, their articles? Uh, we do have a process. Um, there is a, a submit button essentially on the website, um, but we just don't get that many authors to uh, to use that to find there. A lot of times, Christine and I will work behind the scenes in order to uh, put in like a batch of items into the repository. Uh, for I'm thinking mostly of like the undergraduate research symposium uh, will work, will have the students submit items through a, a different system like Microsoft Forms or Google Forms. And then we'll save the PDF documents, have all the metadata worked on, and then we'll put them into the repository behind the scenes instead of having each individual student submit it directly through the repository. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, having systems in place can really help just increase the content, um, the, qu the qu quantity of content. Um, and, um, this one is for Joe or others. So, um, what has been your experience with copyright compliance awareness with your repository? This is something we often run into at our institution. Folks are sometimes enthusiastic about submitting their work, but when we explain, we can't take the final version, they lose interest or become frustrated. So some frustrations with the, the green self archiving, um, model. Yeah, we've worked with some authors who you know just want to give us the final uh, PDF that they've published with whatever publisher. Then we explain that you know we can have the peer-reviewed version as a final draft. Um, so it, uh, for I think for authors who do want to have more of their content available open access, they'll take the time to find that Microsoft Word version or whatever slightly previous version to whatever had been turned into a and laid out as a PDF at the end. Um, but it, I, I think it is a detriment and copyright is just such a a mess. And, and like um, my colleague, Seth Valetta, she usually deals with a lot of the copyright questions. Um, I, I know a good amount of copyright, but I'd rather have uh, more of a definitive answer done by one of my colleagues. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so uh, a question for the, the group. Um, I'd be interested in the panelists' thoughts on the subscribe to open publishing model for journals. So uh, uh, yeah, maybe I could take that one. Yeah. yeah we, we've looked at a couple of these things. I think it's a really promising idea. You know, what you want is some sort of collective, I, I, the way I understand it, some sort of consensus uh, to be able to uh, to get enough interest in a journal to make it worth, you know, being just supported by the uh, by the subscriptions. Um, I don't know how to make this work, you know, for places that don't have subscriptions and how this sort of like changes the planning for this uh, for for an economic model, unless you are already well established. If you have well established, say, okay, you know, if I'm going to get enough money from my subscriptions, then 
uh, maybe that's good enough and we'll make that open access. Uh, maybe others have some way of thinking about this, but I think that, uh, you know, I, I would like to understand how, how this would work for, you know, uh, anything other than establish um, publishers who could make this decision on one year at a time. Yeah. Okay, maybe I could say a little bit more. The idea here, I understand, and whoever asked the question could also explain this, and maybe you know, Emily, uh, that every year there's a decision as to whether there's enough there from this from the subscriber base to be able to keep that journal open access or not. And I think uh, that works if you have large bodies that are dealing with subscriptions. Did I get anything wrong there? I Yeah, and... You know, also, I, you know, I'm curious as to, like, you know, you were talking about the different e economic models, you know, with the approach for converting, you know, if it, you know, if an, if there's a, if it hits a quota for a number of, you know, open access, um, if it hits enough an open access quota, it could be um, flipped. But uh, yeah, and I'm seeing another comment come through. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, it's, you know, it's exciting to hear about, uh, field robotics and, um, a similar thing happened at a well-known neuroscience journal at Elsevier this past spring, NeuroImage, um, and hopefully more journals will follow suit as you did, you know, you did, and this will become sustainable. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. I mean, I it, it's not sustainable right now, right? We have been hunting for this this uh, model that will keep keep the the journal high quality. I mean, one one idea that was offered to us, just so you know, is hey, make the template for the papers available. Paper is accepted through the uh, review process, and you you give the template to the authors and say, hey, go to town, and make this into a publishable PDF, and then you know we'll put it up on our journal. That could take care of some of the costs, but uh, I think it doesn't on you know doesn't remove the economic model thing here. I think what we need is some way to think about how um, you know when a single is when a, a when a song is played on the radio or on Spotify or whatever, um, the singer gets like one or two cents or something like this, right? I mean, I think. If we could use come up with a model that's similar to that, maybe the publisher can actually recover their costs. Um, and if it was hugely successful, the authors could get some of that money back too. Um, but I, 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 I think this is this is where open access has to go. Otherwise, what it will be is, um, you know, the authors are are put in a huge amount of work, more or less, because they. They're in it for um, academic publishing, scholarly publishing, and um, you know they're not going to be able to afford to keep um, journals afloat, despite the fact that they do all the work. In addition to the fact that they do all the work and generating the research and writing it and reviewing the papers, et cetera. So if they have to pay for it, also it seems like it's it's going to be hard to scale this thing. So just some thoughts there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the high APCs, you know, I know it's been brought up a bit today and about how, you know, how are we making sure that we're also inclusive or researchers or specifically authors from institutions or countries that aren't funded enough to to support that. And, you know, I understand, just like we said, the even right now it's the model that big publishers are businesses and they need to demonstrate profit to shareholders. So it, it's going to take a lot of creativity to make some substantial change on that front. Um, and I, I think there's some interesting alternative models, you know, um, like uh, Peer J has that lifetime membership option, which waives membership fees for authors that are coming from low income countries. And so I'll be curious to to see more creativity in that space um, as a response. Um, we are just about out of time. Um, if you have any last thoughts that you had to, you know, you really wanted to share with the group, I welcome, welcome you to, to, to do so, but um, I really appreciate these great talks. Um, 
from you three, really from out the whole day. Um, and we have uh, one more quick uh, wrap up session after this. So um, Joe, Jason and Sanjeev, thank you again. Uh, yeah. Really appreciate it. And um, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to Melanie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for those of you in the audience and for all of our speakers today. Um, before we wrap up with our closing remarks, I do want to remind you that we have a survey that is linked at the top of the community notes document. We do appreciate any feedback that you might have um, as it helps us plan the next Open Science Symposium. Um, so with that, we are going to end the day with um, closing remarks from the Dean of University Libraries, Keith Webster. Um, Keith has been a champion of open science for a long time now. Um, and so he's going to share his thoughts on this topic. He had some travel disruptions, but he thought this might happen and had the foresight to record his comments for us. So I will play that recording for you now. And it's just... Um, about 10 minutes of comments. So a brief wrap up to the end of the day. My screen. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this final session in the 2023 Open Science Symposium brought to you by Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. I'm Keith Webster, Dean of Libraries. I wanted to offer a few remarks to help set some framing around an institution's perspective on open science. Let me do so by positioning the work we're engaged in today in some historical context in the first instance. The earliest scientific journals began to appear in the middle of the 17th century, and until then, researchers to a large extent had little incentive, often um, persecution, religious impositions that got in the way of their sharing and opening up the products of their scholarly endeavours. But scientific journals changed the dynamic. These offered a mechanism through which researchers could share their ideas with each other. Fast forward 300, 350 years, and whilst the journal business, of course, has expanded dramatically, it is really the advent of digital technology that has accelerated the progress towards a truly open scientific market. Um, whilst many important endeavors have emerged along the way, I would point to the report from the Royal Society released in 2012 as a real driver of the momentum that we are enjoying today. And as we look to progress into the United States, we see um, things like conferences and toolkits coming from the National Academies. And of course, we have all celebrated and appreciated the designation of 2023 as the Federal Year of Open Science. And as that year comes to an end, I think it's timely to look back on how we got here and where we go next. There's little doubt that the COVID pandemic has had a real driving effect on policymakers' perspectives. I think that UNESCO really framed this very elegantly, that the pandemic brought together the global scientific community in ways that we simply hadn't seen previously. We saw that players from universities, industry, government and research organizations came together across their organizational boundaries. And the research community crossed national borders because we all recognized that we were in this together and that the fastest way to discover treatments, 
pursue a quest for vaccines was by global open collaboration. And I have heard many leaders in the past two or three years say that we simply can't go back, that the pandemic and the impact on scientific activity pointed a way that has to be part of the future. But of course, in doing so, we recognize that each of us is part of an institution or organization, and we all need to collaborate. So let me just say briefly how we think about open science at Carnegie Mellon. And I do so through the perspective, as you would imagine, of Carnegie Mellon University Libraries, as that is the bit of the university with which I am most commonly associated. But I will say that what we do in the university libraries really is about building a service, offering expertise that is for the university. These are things that are administratively housed in the university libraries, but I very much view them as university activities. And our work over the past eight to 10 years has been framed in the context of Carnegie Mellon University's strategic plan, within which it set out an ambition to create a 21st century library, inherent in which was a recognition that scholarly communication is changing and that we need to be conscious of developing our services in a way that aligns with that. When we think about open science from a library perspective, invariably our historical reputation has been built upon managing the record of scholarship. And in an open science environment, we recognize that through the perspective of providing open access to the publications, data, and software and code that represent the primary artifacts of the research process. But in seeking to maximize access to these, we need to recognize that the scientific workflow has to be optimized to ensure that the products of research are developed where possible in a way that maximizes their shareability, their usability, their reproducibility. And we have spent a lot of time building an end-to-end -end open science workflow that offers our research community a suite of services and tools that we have tested and believe offer great functionality. And we've done so in partnership with organizations like protocols.io and lab archives and the open science framework. And my colleagues will be glad to talk with you about their perspectives on these workflow solutions. Let me turn to the ways in which we are supporting the opening of the products of research. Firstly, for publications, we have a range of approaches to supporting open access. For example, we support preprint servers, we offer an institutional repository, and we provide financial support for open access article fees. But our institutional view has been firmly that we wish to allow our researchers to retain the rights to the work that they publish. And we also wish to take the administrative headache out of the researcher's submission and publication of articles. And therefore, we have pursued an approach to securing agreements with our major publishers, such that any article with a Carnegie Mellon corresponding author will be made open access, assuming the author agrees, immediately upon publication. In 2018, I looked back at our publishing activity in preceding years and recognized that 72% of Carnegie Mellon's output had been published in the journals managed by half a dozen major publishers. And that represented an opportunity for us to work with those publishers to arrive at agreements that met our needs. 
And over the last couple of years, we have continually reached out to publishers to maximize those opportunities for our researchers. Um, perhaps most notably, our first agreement was with Elsevier, um, the first institutional agreement of the sort that the world's biggest publisher had um, agreed to. And in the intervening period, we have worked with many other publishers. The one that was top of my list, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, remains a tough nut to crack. But I do hope that over the next year, they will come to the table with a business model that we can sign up to. On the data management front, um, our generalist repository, which accommodates publications, data, code, images, presentations, you name it, as long as it's digital, it will fit into the, the Figshare platform, which we have branded as Kilt Hub. And we offer services and expertise to ensure that our researchers can meet funder requirements for data management plans and for data sharing, as well as collaborative opportunities where those are appropriate. And just to give you a sense of how we have to have a bit of tartan or plaid in the branding that is the, the Kilt Hub homepage. To meet the needs of software, we were grateful to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, the foundation in 2022 awarded us a significant grant to establish an open source programs office. You will have heard from Saeed Chowdhury this morning about our work in that area. And that represents part of an overall approach where we serve the university community through a collaborative network that represents our aspirations around open science and open data. Uh, we provide training to the university community through the Carpentries series of workshops and through locally designed interventions. In doing so, we focused on ensuring that our colleagues are as up to date as possible. And my colleague, Emily Bongiovanni, led a team that secured an IMLS grant to support the development of a national open science training program. But the sense of community is also at the heart of what we do. Um, we've seen things like rapid prototyping through hackathons. We have sought opportunities to work with the policymakers to ensure that they understand an institutional perspective. And Said and I had an article published in The Hill a few weeks ago that talks about many of these issues. And we ensure that where possible, the university community understands what we are offering. This is just the, the heading of a substantial news item that we released to celebrate the year of open science and ensure that our community is aware of what we can offer. But let me conclude by recognizing that software is a primary research object. Uh, the, the White House um, memo that came out last year about public access to the products of research was notably silent on software for good reason. But we shouldn't ignore the fact that software is important. Earlier today, you heard about the development of the Carnegie Mellon Cloud Lab. Um, that is going to be um, a facility from which vast amounts of research data will be generated. It is built upon a commercial facility founded by two Carnegie Mellon graduates, and their primary market has been the biotech startup community in Silicon Valley, where a very closed system has been critical. But we were so grateful to Emerald for working with us to make their programming language open source. That is a critical step in opening up the research from the Cloud Lab for shareability. And we are working with the Cloud Lab with our partners at Figshare to ensure that the research coming from the Cloud Lab can be deposited into our Kilt Hub repository where appropriate. I hope that's given you a sense of our agenda at Carnegie Mellon. We, we are focused on the needs of our community, but we are keen to partner with others to ensure that anyone who might benefit from 
the lessons we've learned along the way might do so, but also so that we can benefit from the emerging best practice from other institutions. With that, I want to thank everyone who has made today's event possible. An event like this takes the work of a lot of people. I'm truly grateful to our open science team, to everyone who presented today, to those who ensured that the technology worked, and to everyone who joined us online. We look forward to seeing you at our next Open Science Symposium. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you to Keith for the closing comments, and um, I'll just echo his thanks to everyone who participated in this event, our speakers, all of the attendees who offer great questions and comments throughout the day, um, as well as the organizing committee. We will be sharing the recordings um, as well as the slides from this event in a follow-up email. Um, we also have the survey that I mentioned before. If you can take a moment to fill that out, we'd really appreciate any feedback as we plan future events. And we have our newsletter linked um, at the top of the community notes as well. And you can subscribe to that if you'd like to hear about future events, such as the next Open Science Symposium. Um, as Dean Webster mentioned, we welcome partnership and collaboration. So please don't be shy about reaching out and uh, we will see you at the next symposium. Thank you. <laughs>